attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And now that I've said that officially, I want all your listeners to forget that. Okay. Uh, because the name ADHD in of itself is part of the reason why we have so many stigmas and so much misunderstanding about all the different ways ADHD can appear. I thought it was really interesting that you said most of us think of ADHD as um, the little boy that can't sit still, that's hyper, and that's exactly it. That is what people studied for a very long time. That is what the uh, diagnostic criteria is based on, um, and that is the image a lot of us have in our minds. And that can be ADHD, but it's so much more than that. Hey, what's up, everyone? Thanks for joining me again on the Eric Fiero Podcast. I'm really excited for today's guest. It's a good friend of mine. She's a speaker, a coach, and a writer. And today we're going to talk all about an excellent topic, ADHD. Meredith Carter is here with me. How are you today? I am doing good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation. I was actually telling Jessica that I've been wanting to do this for a while because I think it's going to be something really helpful to a lot of people who watch my podcast. And... First and foremost, almost everybody at this point knows the term ADHD, may not specifically know what it means or the definition. They just think of a hyperactive kid, right? Because that's what a lot of times you get told is, hey, your kid has ADHD because he's really hyper. And so I want to first start by kind of diving into that and talking about like what what is ADHD specifically? So ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And now that I've said that officially, I want all your listeners to forget that. Okay. Uh, because the name ADHD in of itself is part of the reason why we have so many stigmas and so much misunderstanding about all the different ways ADHD can appear. I thought it was really interesting that you said most of us think of ADHD as um, the little boy that can't sit still, that's hyper, and that's exactly it. That is what people studied for a very long time. That is what the uh, diagnostic criteria is based on, um, and that is the image a lot of us have in our minds. And that can be ADHD, but it's so much more than that. So uh, it ADHD, I want to kind of break down why I don't like the name. So attention deficit. When I hear attention deficit, um, I'm thinking about somebody that can't pay attention. What are you thinking about when you hear that phrase? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's hard to capture your attention, stay focused. It's hard mm -hmm. to stay focused. Yeah, and the focus is definitely a component. Being able to focus and stay focused, it can be a big problem for people with ADHD. So that part isn't wrong, but it doesn't paint the whole picture. Uh, it's really not necessarily just an attention deficit. It's an issue with regulating attention. Mm. So people with ADHD can pay attention. They just can't, can't direct their attention as much as a neurotypical person. So a lot of people, um, they think of that focus, I can't pay attention, I'm daydreaming, they think of that piece. But there's a whole nother piece that comes in called hyperfocus. So some people with ADHD or most people with ADHD also have this ability to really intensely focus on certain things. Okay. Those are usually things that they're interested in. Those are usually things that are exciting. Um, and it can be so intense that it's almost painful for people to break that focus. Really? Yes. So, I mean, you're talking about like a lot of entrepreneurs then could have ADHD because that's one of the telltale signs for so many is that they get hyper-focused. Like when mm -hmm. they have a an idea and they know they need to execute, they get hyper-focused, don't want to be almost, it's obsessive, right? Where they mm -hmm. just want to make sure that they complete what they started without interruption. Is that kind of along the same lines? Yeah, absolutely. So it can look like a lot of things, but in entrepreneurship, that is definitely a way it can show up. Um, so if you are like really into capturing some sales or you're really looking to solve a problem or there's some learning piece that you're super interested in, you can go, go at that for hours. You can probably get more done and be massively productive in the time that you're hyper-focused than someone that doesn't have ADHD um, can be. 
Uh, but the the dark side of that for people with ADHD is if we don't understand what that is, um, oftentimes it can be a big contributor to burnout. We have to recover from that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and in children, sometimes that looks like that kid that... Um, you know, the parents are upset at them because they can't focus in school, but they're really focused on their video games mm-hmm. or they're really focused on their sport or a book even. Yeah. So that's why I think it's important to kind of redefine how we think of it. So what do we do in those situations where we're trying to raise our children and they're in an environment that's, you know, where the curriculum is pretty standard. And so they already have a certain way that things are supposed to be. And they've been like that for the last 50 years but it really doesn't fit the mold. And I mean, I'm sure for the last 50 years, people have been having this same issue, right? Children have been having the same focus attention issues because they just, they're just they more passionate, it sounds like, about something else. Mm-hmm. That's what's on their mind, right? Yeah, I like to think of it as ADHD is an interest-driven brain, not an importance-driven brain. Oh, okay. So your teacher thinks you paying attention in class and learning math is really important. And some ADHDers might find math really interesting. Um, but there's usually something else taking that focus. So coming back to what do we do with trying to fit into these systems that aren't really designed for brains like this. And it's very hard. Yeah. Um, I think ADHD, that's why I talk so passionately about helping people identify it. Because um, you really touched on something when you were like, this environment isn't right. Because for me, one of the biggest reasons an ADHD person uh, either feels like they're thriving or failing is based on the environment uh, they're either forced into or that they create for themselves. Yeah. I think that is an adult then to me when you speak of adhd they think of okay this is a disorder right that's Mm -hmm. the word that's attached to a disorder they think something's wrong with me yeah but it almost sounds just from what you've said so far that this can actually be honed into almost like a super skill Um, yeah almost like a superpower Mm -hmm. right is that is that a fair way to look at it yeah I think it can be really hard um for people that are in a spot where like their ADHD is giving them a lot of struggles to think of it as a superpower and everyone's different in terms of like how they're going to view this um thing that is labeled as a disorder and again I think it comes down to how much support you have how much privilege you have can you afford to um be able to get help with it are you able to hire some people in your life to take care of the things that are very hard for you Um, but in the right circumstances there are some really incredible strengths that can come with having your brain wired this way absolutely so the thing that I've noticed and I've have a lot of insurance agents because that's the the niche that I'm mainly in is in the insurance world but um, I think this probably would go for anybody but a lot of times they the overwhelming feeling can be something that's just so intense that I've seen the people who have ADHD say I, I can't, I don't even know where to start. I don't know mm-hmm. what to do. Like I, and, and they basically just drop it all. Right. Yeah. Because they just, they get stuck. And I get that for me, you know, without having ADHD, maybe I do. <laughs> I mean, the more you're talking about it, I was like, maybe I do. But I feel like one of the things that has helped me anytime that I start to feel that sense of overwhelm is just that simple idea of, Hey, you can just, just finish one task at a time. Mm-hmm. And no matter how sm- small or how big it is, just take one step at a time and then another and then another. And eventually you'll look back and you'll see that you've accomplished all the tasks, right? Mm-hmm. But it's when you look at everything that needs to be done all at once that you have that, that impending sense of doom where you're just like, I don't know if I can do this. So I, I guess where I'm going with that is uh, what are some techniques then that us as adults who are having these different uh, senses of overwhelm or these senses of hyper focus where, mm-hmm. like you said, it almost hurts to be distracted because I think from both ends of the spectrum, one being not being able to do anything to one only be able to focus on one thing instead of maybe spending time with family, paying attention to your wife, your children. How do we how do we balance this the situation? Um, it can be tough. So when you mentioned overwhelm, overwhelm is probably the number one thing that my clients talk to me about, people that I'm meeting that have ADHD struggle with. We almost call it like chronic overwhelm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I want to back up what back to what you were saying about like 
let's just break off one thing at a time. And that's really, really good advo- advice. We always say make it smaller when we're looking at um, a project specifically that's overwhelming us. But what's tricky about ADHD is there's, I can probably list 10 reasons we're more susceptible to overwhelm with a brain like this. Um, I actually have a resource where I have them all listed and then they point to strategies and it's that complex yeah. for people with ADHD. Um, so I think that when overwhelm is an issue that people are dealing with and coping with and that is getting in their way, uh, one of the best things you can do is build your self-awareness around ADHD in general and start to get better about being able to identify the source of overwhelm. Because sometimes it's what you mentioned. The project's too big. It's too nebulous. ADHD brains do show um, struggles with executive functions. And one of those executive functions is prioritizing. Uh. So what's hard for people with ADHD, like it's hard for a lot of people to prioritize, right? Right. But uh, we're uniquely impaired in that way because we struggle to know Um, what the most important thing is to do. And even if we do know, we struggle to get our brain activated to the important thing. So we could know, yes, I need to get up and take a shower so I can be at work on time. But if we're thinking about five other things that need to get done, we get stuck in that overwhelm or we get distracted by the interest. So all of those things can happen. Um, It's a very complex topic. I could talk to you probably for like three episodes on overwhelm. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, guys. Can we pause? Yeah, yeah. So that's just a strategy I use to keep myself on schedule is lots of alarms. Anyways, so when we coming back to overwhelm, again, we could talk about this for hours, but uh, we really have to empower people to understand their brain. So once you start understanding the sources of your overwhelm, um, I suggest having a resource somewhere that lists those what are the most the things that overwhelm you most often and then having a tie to a different strategy because the different um reason is going to need a different approach okay uh so while that advice will work for some things about like let's break it down one by one we might need a different approach for a different like reason we're overwhelmed yeah it's not one size fits all exactly a lot of times it's not even just the tasks it's the emotions are very overwhelming for people with adhd we talked about attention regulation emotional regulation is also a component of adhd how do so so help me out with that because i you know my wife and i always have this discussion where when she wants to talk about certain topics she's very emotional about how she approaches things and Mm -hmm. i'm very logical so i try to I try to come down to that emotional level where I could be like, okay, stop thinking up here, think more mm-hmm. here, and, and try to try to understand where she's coming from. I struggle with that. Um, so, but for those who are the other side, who maybe the emotional is what guides them ninety nine percent of the time, and it's not always a good thing. From what mm-hmm. I've noticed, what are some coping mechanisms? What are some things that people who are heavily driven by emotion that they can become maybe more logical i don't even know if that's the answer to become more logical or to try to be more logical about the problem but i guess you can tell me yeah so um emotional regulation is it's not necessarily about um necessarily leading with your emotions it's not it's the inability to come back to like a state of regulation so meaning like if you get really angry it's like you're angry or you're really happy or you're really sad or you're really embarrassed so that regulation can come on very very quickly for people with adhd um and when you talk about it kind of like not always being a good thing uh the, the things they're feeling are real, right? Those emotions yeah. are real. But what we have to learn is to be able to put guardrails in place so that those emotions don't sabotage our life, right? right? So if you are at work and you're giving somebody feedback with ADHD, a lot of us really struggle with um, something called rejection sensitivity dysphoria. So that means we're having a huge physical body reaction to a real or perceived rejection. So it could be something very minor and our body is reacting a lot of times it's the words are coming out of our mouth at a rapid rate we're getting defensive or we're crying or we are like in that moment so learning to have that emotional literacy and notice those reactions and almost kind of like reparenting yourself into a way to like put the pause on yeah. So if you're having a big reaction, that re- that reaction is valid. But learning to be able to say, 
hey, I need to get to a more regulated place before we can discuss this topic. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you talk about relationships, you talk about just like a husband and wife, you know, leading with emotions versus leading with our head. A lot of times I think when it comes to just how we're feeling in that moment, sometimes we just want to be seen in those emotions and be validated, but also be given the space to come back and do whatever we need to do to be more regulated. Um, and there's lots of tools you can experiment with to learn more about emotional regulation. Yeah. But if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, oh, that's me, I would definitely start looking into um, things like breathing techniques, uh, ways to rehearse language that allows you to leave the conversation effectively before you explode. Give me or... an example of that. I like that. Give me yeah. an example of how I can exit a conversation. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what the conversation's about. Let's say it's an angry, <laughs> but let's say it's an angry one, yeah. right? Where where it just it has to do with with I don't know you you let's just say your child your mm -hmm. child has been talking back to you a lot and you don't want to have to yell at him yeah you know I don't know if there's a way to kind of but you're like hot because you're just like mm -hmm. oh you just stop talking to me like that yeah so how do you exit the conversation I guess I think it's a little different between an adult and with a child yeah. um, like in a work situation or any type of adult communication that's not um, really emotionally centered like family things like that uh, I say things like um, I feel like I've gotten a little off course here. I need to take a minute to process or take some time to process and let's set a goal of revisiting this conversation in an hour, two hours, whatever is realistic for yeah. that. Um, and the language is going to differ, but think about how you can communicate like an I statement versus a you statement to the person you're speaking with. So if it's I need some time to recalibrate, that sounds much better to the person receiving it than you are out of control. You are making me mad. You're making me feel this way. Yeah. That puts everybody on the defense and that's just going to escalate. So thinking about an I statement that allows you to express your need to go regulate. And again, you don't always have to say, I need to go regulate my emotions. Not every work environment <laughs> is going to support you on that. But just, you know, think about what would make sense in the conversations and rehearse it ahead of time, I think is the most important thing. What I'm, what I'm hearing in that is that it's it's actually good to it because I think so often nowadays people are just like, hey, you need to speak your truth. Like regardless of what it is, you're hot in the collar, someone did you wrong, you get in their face, you tell them what's what. And But I always think that that can lead to escalation, mm -hmm. you know, not a good thing. So yeah. you're kind of saying, hey, it's actually better. It's not to say that you're going to ignore the situation or let them get away with it. You need to, though, at least step back to a point where you're no longer so hot under the collar so that you mm -hmm. don't say something inappropriate or something you can't take back. Yeah. Because I think that's what happens a lot of times in these conversations and heated exchanges is that mm -hmm. you say things that a lot of times can't get taken back, mm -hmm. you know, or even if you say sorry, the the resentment is now there because the other person is just like, oh, so that's what they think. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think it's really important to think about... Um, what you're talking about is like that feeling of wanting to be authentic and use our voice. And I am all about that. I I really, really steer people towards not feeling like they have to make themselves smaller. Mm -hmm. But I think there's gray area there, right? We can't just say whatever we want and have it not hurt people and hurt ourselves. So I look at um, kind of how I live my life is thinking about giving myself space to uh, get into a place where I'm ready to respond, not react. Uh, people in therapy circles say this all the time. Um, the issue with ADHD is the react comes so fast. It's yeah. so hard to control that reaction at times. So we just need to know this about ourselves. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to say the thing that first popped into your mind when you wanted to respond or react initially. Maybe that reaction is valid and maybe that is what you want to say, but you're going to feel a lot better about saying it if you're saying it from a place of regulation and um, discernment and being thoughtful because like you said you can't take it back once it's there yeah. and we're not going to be perfect we're going to say things heat in the heat of the moment sure. um, and we can always look at repairing in that case but I do think that keeping in mind that it doesn't mean you're not being authentic if you're not saying it that first time it pops into your head but giving right. yourself the space to really evaluate that reaction can be helpful so give me like kind of a list uh it, it, it could be as long or as short as you wanted to but for those of us who are just like maybe I have ADHD and I didn't even realize it. 
you know, your passion is to help people diagnose that and to realize that because the faster they can and the more they can start getting tools to help. Mm -hmm. So give me like a list of just some things that people should start looking out for yeah. that are like, hey, because there's some obvious signs, but then there's mm -hmm. probably some more subtle signs as well that people aren't aware of. Absolutely. I want to, before I jump into that, I want to say that, um, you know, when you're saying, I think I might have it too. Maybe you do. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people will say, I think I might have a little ADHD or, oh, we all have ADHD moments. We all do that. So first, let's start with the way you phrased it was perfectly great. Like, oh, I'm curious versus people saying, oh, you know, we all are a little that way. That feels dismissive yeah. to the person with ADHD. But if you're truly curious about yourself or if someone's listening to this thinking, OK, I'm relating to a lot of things. The first thing I'd like to say is a lot of the things we deal with as people with ADHD, everybody does deal with. We all have emotions. Sometimes yeah. they're really big. A lot of us have trouble with focus. There's a lot of reasons you might be struggling with focus. Um, you might struggle with attention. Those th It is true that we all struggle with those things at times. But to be able to get a diagnosis of ADHD, you have to be able to meet a certain criteria um, and number of symptoms, and they have to have impacted you in more than one area of your life throughout your lifespan. So if you are just now feeling like you can't focus at 40 and your life is really crazy and busy, like that's probably situational or maybe yeah. there's something medically going on. So I just wanted to say that Kavet, because the people are going to hear a lot of things that sure. resonate, but I want people to think about that are listening. Like, was this showing up in childhood? Even if it didn't look like a boy falling out of a chair, what, what, what could it have looked like for me? And that's where we usually need more nuance. But, um, the hyperactivity symptom is one, but what's tricky about that symptom is that it looks more than one way. So it isn't just physical like, hyperactivity. Right. It can be um, internal hyperactivity. Like it feels like your brain doesn't want to shut off. Uh -huh. Like your thoughts are bouncing around. Usually if people are experiencing that, that shows up in their speech. So if you were to have a conversation, you've had conversations with me when I'm just off the cuff and I'm just talking, talking, talking. I am talking in circles and it's because that's where my brain is taking me and it's making sense for me yeah our brain isn't thinking in a literal way like i'm talking i'm like so excited to tell you something and then something else that i'm so excited to tell you pops into my head so that would be an example of how like a physical presentation of like a more internal hyperactivity so um so you're saying you could, you could switch on a dime like oh yeah like, and i do bop. yep <laughs> <laughs> i just spent um four days with a bunch of people with adhd at the adhd international conference yeah. and i went Wish you had recordings of those conversations because I was like, oh my gosh, people that talk like me. It's so fun. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that can present hyperactivity can look like someone that talks a lot, talks fast. Uh, it can look like someone that just always needs to be busy. Like they uh, need to, like they can't have free time in their calendar. They're always wanting to do something. Um, and it can be that physical hyperactivity. But here's where it gets tricky. So not everyone that has ADHD has the hyperactivity component. Oh. So there's three presentations of ADHD. There's the ADHD, which is with the hyperactivity component. We call that hyperactive type. Yeah. There is ADHD inattentive type. It used to be, and it's still commonly known as ADD, like you take the H out. Right. But that act, that term was actually only used for two years back in, like, I think the 80s. I could be wrong on the timeline. I'm not great with numbers, but a long time ago. And uh, they, they put it all under the ADHD umbrella. But it's confusing, right? Because yeah. if you're inattentive and you don't have that hyperactivity, you're like, how can I have this? This doesn't make sense. Right. Um, so that is another presentation. And then combined type. So combined type, I think, is most of us because or there's a strong amount of uh, people that have inattentive only. Uh, so if you have hi hyperactivity, you probably have the inattentive type as well. Um, but I think that's important to clarify. So if I'm talking about hyperactivity and people are like, well, I'm not hyper at all. I'm like very chill, but I can't focus. Then yeah. you might be an inattentive type. It's your brain that's Yeah. That's and even that, sometimes you don't even have that fast moving brain. Um, but you have primary symptoms of inattention. That is um, stereotypically, and I say stereotypically versus commonly, um, um, because I think that's an important distinction. Stereotypically, uh, women are diagnosed with inattentive ADHD much more often. A lot of times they look like that child in grade school that wasn't a problem for their teacher, but they were staring off into space. They were the mm. daydreamers. Mm. Um, they were the girl that like 
was a little quieter, but like not really living up to her potential is something we hear a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not just girls, it's boys too. So I, I wanted to throw that out there because it is very confusing for people when they okay. don't relate to the hyperactive symptoms. So you may be hyperactive, but you may not be. Um, and so let's talk about the inattentive symptom next because that's a big one. So that's kind of like the focus thing, right? We um, struggle to maintain focus. We struggle to direct it. Um, we also may have struggles with working memory, which is kind of like short term memory, but a little bit different. It's like the um, the scratch pad you have in your brain, keeping track of what you're doing in the moment yeah. and you're applying it. So an example of struggles with working memory are if you get a password reset and then you have to go check your email and on your way to check your email, something else happens and then you don't even know what you were doing in the first place. So you're uh -huh. like, you find yourself on Reddit reading about dolphins or something. <laughs> like, and that can be that not being able to keep that task in your head. Like, oh, I was going to my email to find this password reset to go reset my password. So it can really trip us up, right? Yeah, yeah. It also is that stereotype, and this happens to me literally on a daily basis, but walking into a room and not knowing how you got there. Like, you're just, you don't know what you were there for. You don't know if you were getting a cup of coffee or if you were going to sign a contract. You don't know why you're there. <laughs> and and um, so that's something that I think is something people relate to. Like yesterday, I um, I went and I picked up something from Target and it was in my trunk. And then I picked up some food from Panera and I got home and I got the thing out of my trunk and I brought it inside and I started a load of laundry. And then I was like, wait a minute, I picked up lunch. <laughs> And then I couldn't find my lunch because you know where my lunch was? In the car. Some, no, not just in the car. It no. was in the trunk. Oh. So I looked in the car, <laughs> but it was in my trunk. And it took like 15 minutes to find it. So that is like that working memory piece, I think, is um, it's funny. Those things are funny. Yeah. But sometimes it's really not funny. Yeah. Sometimes it's not funny when you throw your laptop against the, the wall because yeah. you are so frustrated. So those symptoms of inattention, not being able to like direct or maintain the focus is a big one. Um, there are also symptoms symptoms around um, rumination. So rumination is kind of like we would probably define it more commonly as overthinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's that piece of our brain that like can't get let go of a thought. So we're in our thoughts a lot. We're thinking, thinking, thinking about something and we're turning it over in our brain. And when you say can't let go of the thought, you're talking about hours to days where that same situation or yeah. whatever is just you can't let it go mm -hmm. and sometimes it yeah it, it causes emotional pain right it's stressful um sometimes it, we're ruminating on things that aren't even like a big deal like we're ruminating about like what car seat to buy for our baby yeah. um and we can't turn that off so ev all people do this all people ruminate but the difference with ADHDers is they've been able to show that the pathway in our brain that's ruminating doesn't turn down as much when we start doing an action. So in a neurotypical person, if you were like worried about something or you're ruminating about something and then you just like started working like that, ruminating side would get way quieter. Almost, you wouldn't be able to hear it at all, almost. Mm. For someone with ADHD, it gets a little bit quieter, but it's still going. It's, even though you have other yeah. tasks to focus mm -hmm. on, it's still you're Nine still thinking you. about the thing and it, it's hard to deal with that. It's stressful. It also can give us a lot of um, issues with making decisions so that can impair us at work. Uh. We are thinking about the right decision to make when it probably isn't even that important of a decision. So we right. kind of stay in our thoughts versus into action um, more so than a regular person. So that can be really, really tough. Um, there are some physical things that sometimes manifest for people like difficulties with sleep, um, all kinds of comorbidities there. Oftentimes there is, um, kind of unexplained anxiety feelings mm. and that that's probably tied to that rumination piece as well. And now I'm trying to think of some of the other symptoms I can talk to you about. We talked about, or do you want to, well, I'll I'll, you I want to, I want to ask two things. One, and I'm, let's just go one at a time. I'll, I'll remember the other question. So the first thing is, do you find a lot of adults haven't gone to the doctor or haven't been diagnosed with this but are living with it? And is, is there a reason why they're avoiding getting diagnosed if there's so much resource out there to get help now? Um, I think a lot of people still don't know. They still don't feel validated in the struggles they're experiencing. They think that they're just a bad person, that they just have anger management issues, or they just, you know, mm -hmm. can't cope with boredom, um, or that they just can't get it together. So I think there's a lot of shame that 
stops people. They're not really sure that this is a real thing, that this is something that could be impacting them. Um, and again, I think that comes back to a lot of us just don't really understand what it looks like. Yeah. Uh, I think that there's that piece. Um, I hear frequently from people, there's kind of like two pathways, I feel like, of people, or maybe three, of realizing they have ADHD, or maybe they do. Uh, one of those is if they have a child that uh, gets diagnosed, it's highly hereditable. So yeah. that makes a lot of sense, right? But I'm still surprised at how many parents are dealing with a child with ADHD and I'm talking to them and I'm thinking, hmm, this is making a lot of sense to me and they've never thought about it for them. Yeah. So a lot of people are still not, even people that have children or family members with ADHD still don't quite get how it can look differently with different people. So I think there's a piece there. Um, I also think there is a huge amount of people probably in the same kind of like generation we're in that grew up in like the 80s and 90s, even like as late as the early 2000s that might have been diagnosed as uh, in elementary school or in college. And a lot of times what happens is they get a diagnosis and they're offered medication. They either take it or they don't. Um, people in my generation oftentimes were just say, told not to tell anybody. Yeah, or keep it quiet. Or it was just kind of like, stigma. this is a thing, yeah. And so they weren't given any education on it. Yeah. They just thought that they were having trouble in school or that they were too hyper, that they couldn't focus. Like all the things we've talked about, they didn't get all the nuances of how this is going to continue to show up in their lives. So they just didn't think about it for just a long time. Just deal with it the best yeah. way possible. Or they didn't want to take medication, so they just kind of were like, okay, well, that was a thing of the past. Um, I talked to a lot of people who are like re-exploring that as adults. Um and then the third pathway, I feel like, is just the explosion of information. Uh, it makes a lot of sense that since platforms like TikTok and Instagram and other social media platforms that allow us to engage with educational content in quick, digestible ways, makes sense. Yeah. That that's how a lot of people are finding out about ADHD because we're not picking up a book written by, you know, some doctor about a kid to learn about ADHD for no reason. Like right. we're not able to identify that. Um, our doctors aren't talking to people about like adults about this. I know yeah. a lot of people that were in therapy for years before anybody identified it. So I think the explosion of social media has also brought awareness there. Um, well, it also helps to show that, uh, that, that it's more prevalent than people might even mm -hmm. be, might have realized. And that, the more people are going on social that and talking about their experiences, the more comfortable others feel saying, you know what, maybe I do need to get some help. Maybe I do yeah. need to talk to somebody uh, because I am uh, very much, you know, experiencing the same thing that that mm -hmm. person is. So yeah. I think, you know, your your channel exploded like you. So you have an Instagram channel. What What mm -hmm. is the the. Uh, your handle on Instagram. It's hummingbird underscore ADHD. Yeah, so hummingbird underscore ADHD. So make sure to go look her up um, and, and you can start seeing a lot of her videos she's posting on there and the resources that, uh, because you're obviously that's the coach part of what she does, right? So uh, you, you do a lot of coaching to help people with the different ways that they can thrive in this. In fact, mm -hmm. you wrote a book, a book that's, what's the date that your book comes out? Well, it might be getting moved. I have a meeting right after this to discuss okay. that, but it will be this summer sometime, okay. July, August, September. September time and frame. what's the name of your book? It's called It All Makes Sense Now. Embrace your ADHD brain and live a creative and colorful life. I have that it up on the subtitle. That subtitle is <laughs> getting me. Um, but yes, this will be a book that, you know, I think parents of children could probably better understand their kids if they read it or family members. But it's really written for people that have gotten to a point in their life where maybe they were diagnosed as a kid but didn't really dive into it or they were diagnosed as an adult. And wanting to truly understand this and then apply the right strategies that make sense for their brain. Because like you said, a lot of us have this knowing that like we have cool talents. We have things inside of us that we want to get out in the world. But if we don't manage the things that are making that hard and holding us back, we never quite get there. And that's a painful way to feel. Yeah. And I felt that way for a lot of my life. So a lot of this book is focused on um, my personal stories just to help people feel seen and related to and, and normalize the experience and the emotions of getting this information so yeah. late into my life and all of the shame and weird things that happen when we don't know what we're dealing with. Um, and then I go into just kind of explaining some common symptoms and challenges. Um, and then I provide some coaching tools. So there's actionable strategies in my book as well to help people um, really start to create the life they want. So one last question that I wanted to ask because you were you you had mentioned a few times in, in your previous answers about adults who 
were presented medication as an option for treatment and they decided to pass on it. Is this something that is managed, not only manageable, but that you're able to thrive, as you mentioned in your book, right? You, it all makes sense now to how to thrive with ADHD. Can you do that without medication, with just maybe changing in diet, the type of foods you're taking in, uh, breathing techniques, all the other stuff that you've been mentioning? That's a complicated question. I would say it really depends on how much support you have, how much access you have to things to make your life easier, uh, what you want to do, what your goals are. Uh, there are some biological things that certainly help. Exercise has been shown to have a similar effect to a stimulant medication, but here's the caveat. For every hour of aerobic exercise, it gives you about four hours of focus. Oh. So that's a little rough, right? Most of us don't go to work for four hours a day. Um, but I will say this about medication. It's a personal decision. I think there, I have seen clients tremendously help. A lot of times we're so impaired by our symptoms that we can't do any of these strategies unless we seek additional support. Um, I think of it as a tool. It's a tool you may need. It's a tool you may not need. Um, it's a tool you might use long term. It's a tool you might use short term. So I say to be open to it um, and discuss that with your doctor. Obviously, people's different health profiles are going right. to qualify. There's a lot of different options. Um, can you manage without this? Absolutely. There's plenty of people that do. Um, I have gone through periods where I'm on medication and when, periods I'm not. Um, and when I'm in a good environment, that works okay. Yeah. But a lot of us just don't have as much control over our environment and what we're presented and our circumstances. So right. it is very complicated. I don't want anyone to feel like they have to try to do this without a tool that's been scientifically proven to help but I also understand that medication isn't perfect and there's a lot of reasons to want to um, use other tools as yeah. well so I think that's just a personal decision and um, absolutely it's not a requirement people often ask me should I if I know I don't want to do medication should I still pr uh, pursue a diagnosis right and I always say if it's accessible to you if you live in a country or an area where you can get that support and it's not thousands and thousands of dollars go for it because I think it's very validating it can open up um, doors to explore your brain a little bit more closely and if you ever find yourself at a point where you really do need medical support like you've already got that diagnosis you're not already at the point of like max burnout and struggling before yeah. you try to initiate the process because it's really hard to like do paperwork and make phone calls and do all of the steps that takes to get a diagnosis as a person with ADHD right. and if you're super struggling at that moment like if you're feeling okay and curious I would say there is absolutely and it's accessible I would say go for it and get that information I think that there's you know just in this first podcast I plan on doing more with you if you would you know want to come back I think there's more conversations that we can dive into and go more in depth on because this information like I said it's it it opens up my mind to look at things differently um, and I think that you're you're going to be able to help, and you already have helped so many people. So as I mentioned before, you know, that make sure to go and check out Meredith on her uh, on her uh, Instagram page. Also, the book that's coming out it's going to be out soon, and we'll be promoting it. We'll be talking about it. It'll be awesome. Um, one last thing, I just want to end. I want to end on this note. So, like when you're in a group with other people, other adults that uh, from from different like let's just say you know from school not from your you know children's school and stuff with the adult parents or parties with friends or whatever do you low key sit there and you just like yeah mm -hmm. yeah they're showing it <laughs> they got they got that they got that ADHD yeah I try to reserve judgment but um, <laughs> let's say I'm not usually surprised who tells me they have ADHD yeah. I've usually kind of pegged it I never suggest it to anyone unless they are truly struggling and I'm like oh look this this might be why yeah um, usually they follow me and I talk to them in an open conversation but we find each other it's like when you've grown up your whole life with a brain that only like five to ten percent of the people like around you have like you notice who talks like you you notice who like gets excited about certain things and I think we kind of are drawn to each other so there's a lot of times yeah. where I feel like I'm like why, why do I have so many friends with ADHD <laughs> and I'm like oh it actually makes a ton of sense so yeah I do I feel like I can spot it especially after a few conversations I'm not a yeah. doctor I can't diagnose it's a complicated diagnosis there's a lot of things to rule out yeah. but um, I, I, I'm usually not surprised <laughs> when someone discloses that to me you've gotten pretty good <laughs> <laughs> awesome well Meredith thank you so much for coming out today 
and, and having a, this conversation with us, a much needed conversation. And again, I do look forward to having more. So um, if you guys, again, if you don't mind coming back again, I would love to have you. Uh, but until next time, guys, keep a lookout. Next video is coming soon. We'll see you on the next one. Take care. Oh,